and, and therefore it cannot, in principle, be applied to the most important questions in human life, questions like how we should raise our children or what constitutes a good life. Now, it's thought from the point of view of science, and Dr. Craig just gave voice to this opinion, that when we look at the universe, all we see are patterns of events. Just one thing follows another. Okay? And, and there's no corner of the universe that, dis that declares certain of its events to be good or evil or right or wrong, apart from us. I mean, our minds, we declare certain events to be better than others. But in doing that, it seems that we're merely projecting our own preferences and desires onto a, a reality that is intrinsically value-free. And where do our notions of right and wrong come from? Well, clearly they've been drummed into us by evolution, with the product of these apish urges and, and social emotions. And then they get modulated by culture. You take sexual jealousy, for instance. I mean, this is a, an attitude that has been bred into us over millions of years. Okay, our, our ancestors were highly covetous of one another despite the fact that everyone was covered with hair and had terrible teeth. <laughs> and this, this possessiveness now gets enshrined in various cultural institutions like the institution of marriage. Okay, so therefore, a statement like it's wrong to cheat on one's spouse okay, seems a mere summation of these contingencies. It seems like it, it, it's an improvisation on the back of biology. Okay, it seems that, that, that from the point of view of science, it can't really be wrong to cheat on your spouse. Okay, this is just, just how apes like ourselves worry when we learn to worry with words. Okay, now here is where religious people like Dr. Craig begin to get a little queasy, as I think they should. Okay. And many see no alternative but to insert the God of Abraham, an Iron Age God of war, into the clockwork as an invisible arbiter of moral truth. Okay, it is wrong to cheat on your spouse because Yahweh deems that it is so. Okay, which is curious, because in other moods, Yahweh is perfectly fond of genocide and slavery and human sacrifice. Now, I, I must say, it's pretty amusing to hear Dr. Craig in his opening remarks say that I'm merely focused on the flourishing of sentient creatures on this planet. Okay, if that's a sin, I'll take it. Okay, one wonders what Dr. Craig is focused on. Now, incidentally, you should not trust Dr. Craig's reading of me. Half the quotes he provided from me as though I wrote them were quotes from, from people I was quoting in my book and often to different effects. So you'll have to read the book. Uh, now, in, in, in claiming that values reduce to the well-being of conscious creatures, as I will, uh, I'm, I'm introducing two concepts, consciousness and well-being. Now, let's start with consciousness. This is not an arbitrary starting point. Imagine a universe devoid of the possibility of consciousness. Imagine a universe entirely constituted of rocks. Okay, there's clearly no happiness or suffering in this universe. There's no good or evil. Value judgments don't apply. For, for changes in the universe to matter, they have to matter, at, le at least potentially, to some conscious system. Okay, what about well-being? Well, it, it, the, the well-being of conscious creatures and the, and the link between that and morality may seem open to doubt, but it shouldn't. Okay, here's the only assumption you have to make. Imagine a universe in which every conscious creature suffers as much as it possibly can, as much as it possibly can for as long as it can. Okay, I call this the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, the worst possible misery for everyone is bad. Okay, if, if, if the word bad applies anywhere, it applies here. Now, if you think the worst possible misery for everyone isn't bad, or maybe it has a silver lining, or maybe there's something worse, I don't know what you're talking about. And what's more, I'm pretty sure you don't know what you're talking about either. The, <coughs> what I'm saying is the, the minimum standard of moral goodness is to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone. If we should do anything in this universe, if we ought to do anything, if we have a moral duty to do anything, it's to avoid the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay, and the moment you admit this, you admit that, that, that all other states of the universe are better than the worst possible misery for everyone. You have the, the worst possible misery for everyone over here, 
and all these other constellation of experiences arrayed out here. And because the experience of conscious creatures is dependent in some way on the laws of nature, there will be right and wrong ways to move along this continuum. It will be possible to think you're avoiding the worst possible misery for everyone and to fail. You can be wrong in your beliefs about how to navigate this space. So here's my argument for moral truth in the context of science. Questions of right and wrong and good and evil depend upon minds. Okay, they depend upon the possibility of experience. Minds are natural phenomena. They depend upon the laws of nature in some way. Okay, morality and human values, therefore, can be understood through science because in talking about these things, we are talking about all of the facts that influence the well-being of conscious creatures. In our case, we're talking about genetics and neurobiology and psychology and sociology and economics. Now, I view this space of all possible experience as a kind of moral landscape with peaks that correspond to the heights of well-being and valleys that correspond to the lowest suffering. And the first thing to realize is that there may be many equivalent peaks in this space. There may, may be many different but morally equivalent ways for human beings to thrive. But there will be many more ways not to thrive. There will be many more ways to fail to be on a peak. There are clearly more ways to suffer unnecessarily in this world than to be sublimely happy. Now, the Taliban are still my favorite example of a culture that is struggling mightily to build a society that is clearly less good than many other societies on offer. It, the average lifespan for women in Afghanistan is 44 years. Okay, they have a 12% literacy rate. They have the highest, almost the highest infant mortality and maternal mortality in the world, and almost the highest fer fertility. So, this is one of the best places on earth to watch women and infants die. Okay, it seems to me perfectly obvious that the, the best response to this dire situation, which is to say the most moral response, is not to throw battery acid in the faces of little girls for the crime of learning to read. Now, of, cor of course, this is common sense to us, uh, unless you happen to be a bioethicist on the President's Commission at this moment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm saying, at bottom, it is also, these are also truths about biology and neurology and psychology and sociology and economics. It is not unscientific to say that the Taliban are wrong about morality, that the moment we notice that we know anything at all about human well-being, we have to say this. Okay, now, some people with a little philosophical training may be tempted to say, but what if a father wants to burn off his daughter's face with battery acid? You know, who are you to say that he's not as moral as we are? What if he has an alternate conception of well-being that's just as legitimate? Or who's to say that we should care about the well-being of little girls? This is the kind of email I get, incidentally. Now, moral skeptics of this kind, and, and Dr. Craig has essentially endorsed this position, in a way, without God, think that the only way to judge one person's values to be wrong are with respect to another person's values, and all such judgments have to be on a par. Okay, this is not true. Th there are many ways for my values to be objectively wrong. They can be, they can be wrong with respect to deeper values that I hold. They can be wrong with respect to, to deeper values that I would hold if I were only a deeper person. It, it's clearly possible to value things that will reliably make you miserable in this life. Okay, it's clearly possible to be cognitively and emotionally closed to experiences that you would want if you were only intelligent and knowledgeable enough to want them. It is possible not to know what one is missing in life. So things can be right or wrong or good or evil, quite independent of a person's opinions. Now, some of you might worry that I haven't defined well-being enough. How can, how can something this loose as a concept be the, the, the benchmark of, of uh, objective values? Well, consider by analogy the concept of physical health. Physical health is very difficult to define. You know, it, it used to be that if you were healthy, you could expect to live to the ripe old age of 40. You know, now our lifespan, our life expectancy has doubled in the last 150 years. What, what does health mean? Okay, well, it has something to do with not always vomiting, not being in excruciating pain, not running a fever. 
Okay, but how, how fast should a healthy person be able to run? Okay, that, that question might not have an answer. Okay, but this does not make the, the, the question of health vacuous. Okay, it, it doesn't make it merely a matter of opinion or of cultural construction. Okay, the distinction between a healthy person and a dead one is about as clear and consequential as any we ever make in science. Okay, and notice that no one is ever tempted to attack the philosophical underpinnings of medicine with questions like, well, who are you to say that not always vomiting is healthy? What if you meet someone who wants to vomit and he wants to vomit until he dies? Okay, how could you argue that he is not as healthy as you are? In talking about morality and human values, I think we really are talking about mental health and the health of societies. And the truth is, science has always been in the values business. We simply cannot speak of facts without resorting to values. I mean, consider the simplest statement of scientific fact. Water is two parts hydrogen and one part oxygen. This seems as value-free an utterance as human beings ever make. But what do we do when someone doubts the truth of this proposition? Okay, all we can do is appeal to scientific values, the value of understanding the world, the value of evidence, the value of logical consistency. What if someone says, well, that's not how I choose to think about water. Okay, I'm, I'm a biblical chemist, and I read in Genesis 1 that God created water before he created life. So I take that to mean that there were no stars. So there were no stars to fuse helium and hydrogen into heavier elements like oxygen. Therefore, there was no oxygen to put in the water. So either God created, either water has no oxygen or God created special oxygen to put in the water. But I don't think he would do that because that would be biblically inelegant. Okay, what, what can we say to such a person? Okay, all we can do is appeal to scientific values. And if he doesn't share those values, the conversation is over. Okay, if someone doesn't value evidence, what evidence are you going to provide to prove that they should value it? If someone doesn't value logic, what logical argument could you provide to show the importance of logic? Okay, so this, this, I think this split between facts and values should look really strange to you on its face. I mean, what are we really saying when we say that science can't be applied to the most important questions in human life? Okay, we're saying that when we get our biases out of the way, when we, when we most fully rely on clear reasoning and honest observation, when, when intellectual honesty is at its zenith, well, then the, those efforts have no application whatsoever to the most important questions in human life. But that is precisely the mood you cannot be in to answer the most important questions in human life. It would be very strange if that were so. Professor Craig now has 12 minutes for a rebuttal. Timekeeper, are you ready? Begin. You'll recall in my first speech that I said I was going to defend two basic contentions tonight. First, that if God exists, then we have a sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. First, I explain that if God exists, then objective moral values are grounded in the character of God himself, who is essentially compassionate, fair, kind, generous, and so forth. Here, Dr. Harris didn't have anything by way of disagreement to say, but I do want to clear up a possible confusion. He represented this by saying that if religion were not true, then words like good and evil, right and wrong, would have no meaning. I'm not maintaining that. That is to confuse moral ontology with moral semantics. Moral ontology asks, what is the foundation of objective moral values and duties? Moral semantics asks, what is the meaning of moral terms? And I am not making any kind of semantical claim tonight that good means something like commanded by God. Rather, my concern is moral ontology, what is the ground or the foundation of moral values and duties? To give an illustration, think of light. Light is a certain visible range of the electromagnetic 